was a comet. After struggling for 10 years in the United States, he went back to Hong Kong where he rocketed to fame in three films before suddenly dying at the age of 32. There was a service in Hong Kong last week. 12,000 mourners, many of them weeping teenagers, jammed police barricades. He appeared at the height of the Black Power Movement just when the Asian American Movement was getting its start. After a hundred years of yellow face, kowtowing laundrymen, and inscrutable Orientals, here, finally, was a hero we could all look up to. If you've not seen his films, what's come down is a cocky, strutting athlete single-handedly taking down 20 thugs. But Lee played country bumpkins and geeks. It was a message of empowerment. Even a fresh off the boat peasant with bowel problems can still kick your ass. Sort of like that Greek myth about beggars being gods in disguise. Mm -hmm. To be honest, Lee is fantastic, but his films... Oh. I mean, first of all, there's the dubbing. <coughs> Let him know. If I see him here again, he won't leave alive. Uh, uh, Tell him! Uh, uh. Yes, I know, it's supposed to be part of the charm but it's really excruciating and it totally diminishes the power and fury of Lee's performance. What a difference, huh? But like most Asian American cultural icons, Bruce Lee was reduced to a stereotype. I mean, how many of us Asian Americans have had to deal with idiots like this? You know how to do that uh, kung fu stuff, you know, where you can uh, hi -yah, hi -yah, hi -yah, turn a palm tree into a milkshake with your hands? Yeah! If you're Asian American, it's really difficult to divorce yourself from this stereotype. But what's the history? Was there martial arts in America before Bruce Lee? <laughs> Before there was Kung Fu in America, there was Jiu Jitsu. In 1903, railroad tycoon Samuel Hill invited famed judoka Yamashita Yoshitsugu to Seattle and then brought him down to Washington, D.C. to meet President Theodore Roosevelt. Roosevelt had already been training in Jiu Jitsu with a policeman who had formerly been stationed in Nagasaki. Impressed with Yamashita's demonstration, Roosevelt invited him to stay on and train DC policemen in judo. Two years later, in 1905, Judica Itokono arrived in Seattle and opened the first dojo in America, mostly serving Japanese Americans. Jiu Jitsu started in the Fudo era in Japan and it developed out of being disarmed and being able to manipulate your opponent. It's different than Kung Fu. There's more like hammer locks and flipping through the whole world. Grappling exists like acro across the globe, but if you're um, fighting somebody and they're wearing armor, to strike them with your hand, you're just gonna break it. Hence, um, being able to uh, utilize other techniques to overcome the adversary, manipulating the joints, breaking the joints, strangulation techniques. And how did you get in, involved in it? It's kind of like a, a bit of a cliche because in the, in my school days I was I was really gutted. I was underweight and um, I happened across some Bruce Lee videos and this is when you know you had to go to the VHS store. I was just completely like blown away with what I saw. You know, here was this guy, he's fighting 
thugs, the gangsters, and his weapon was his body, and it, also his mind and his spirit and his, and his discipline. Martial artists would stay within that particular style, and it has to be pure, and it was very, in that, that kind of thinking is also kind of rigid. Bruce, he took from many different styles. It was close range, it was long range, it was grappling, and it was striking. And at the end of the way of the Dragon Race, finally, Chuck Norris, you can see in the Coliseum how his footwork is taken from Muhammad Ali. He was like the first mixed martial artist, you can say. You know, his philosophy and thinking of the arts is there in, in his movies. In Way of the Dragon, there's a, a technique in the Aikido curriculum uh, called Ikkyo Pura. And Bruce Lee does that on Bob War. What Bob does is like he comes to like he does like a finger jab or like a thrust to um, Bruce's face. Okay. Bruce blocks it, and he does like a kind of like sort this. Of block. Yeah. Okay. Now. So, uh, oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Ball. Oh. Keep it there. <laughs> okay. Right? Bob then is, is try tries to go for like a wrist lock. Right? Okay. But Bruce reverses it. Right. So he steps one. You know, back leg step step all the way in. And then, and then you hook my elbow and you push my elbow forward okay. and you've locked me here and now you kick me in the teeth <laughs> boom <laughs> the attack's coming oh i try to wrist lock you right now, and then you, I, you step in oh i have to step first step in step. hook my elbow and then hook. turn me down okay, okay. and then, and then kick. You kick me in the okay <laughs> Okay, quick. This is somebody who totally doesn't know any kung fu whatsoever. Well, I think that, that was a great first time. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Chinese form of martial arts was regarded as an ethnic curiosity. In 1890, a newspaper report of a Chinese boxing match in Brooklyn so ignited American curiosity that sensationalized reports of it spread to Wichita and Omaha. But it was still judo and jujitsu that dominated martial arts techniques in America. Suffragettes in the UK learned jujitsu. In the 1936 Olympics, there was a demonstration of judo. In World War II, British and American soldiers were trained in judo. Later, soldiers that occupied Okinawa learned karate, the local form of martial arts. Japanese martial arts made its way to mainstream Western culture by the 1930s. James Cagney was actually a judo black belt, and he demonstrated his skill in two films, meanwhile establishing the trope of the white guy who masters a martial art and becomes learned in all the mysterious ways of the East. In the post-war occupation film Tokyo Joe, there's an amazing sparring scene between Humphrey Bogart and Japanese-American actor Teru Shimada. What you've been doing since you got your discharge, yo? Believe it or not, I got sucked into a legitimate racket, and it ruined me. What racket? Jerkwater Airline. First I fly the seat off my pants, and they repossess the pants. And then there's Sam Fuller's 1959 noir, The Crimson Kimono, with James Shigeta. How you doing, champ? Hi, Joe. What are you trying to prove? I have to qualify for something, Joe. I even goofed at Kendall. Well, you can fill in for me. I don't think Charlie and I can make it this time. You kidding? You guys can't back out now. We're on a case. Ladies and gentlemen, we begin our Kendall tournament of the Nisei Week Festival with last year's champions. amazing it is to see this handsome Asian-American man in a leading role where he actually gets the girl. Because I love you. But then the film devolves into a strange morality tale where James Shigeta's character becomes convinced that the racism is all in his head. 
Talk about gaslighting. By the time Bruce Lee got his breakthrough role as Kato, martial arts were well established in Western media. But what about all those amazing kung fu films from China? Shanghai Film Studios were producing wuxia films starting in the 1920s, but they were largely unknown in the West. The Japanese invasion put a halt to filmmaking in Shanghai, and the film studios moved down to Hong Kong, where they resumed producing wuxia films after the war. In the 1960s, the Shaw brothers started to produce a whole different kind of wuxia film, less fantasy romance and more street fighting. In 1972, Warner Brothers released The Five Fingers of Death in the United States to test the market for martial arts films. It was a box office phenomenon. A few months later, Bruce Lee smashed his way to stardom in The Big Boss. Which brings me to Jim Kelly. Black Americans in World War II were exposed to Japanese martial arts like their white counterparts. And when they returned to the United States, they brought their training with them. And then they taught martial arts to the black communities. Asian martial arts slotted in perfectly with the black power movement. The philosophy of taking someone's force and turning it against them. The desire for pride, masculinity, self-discipline after centuries of subjugation. If you're interested in freedom, you need some judo, you need some karate, you need all the things that will help you fight for freedom. This scene in Enter the Dragon isn't staged. It's filmed at the Black Karate Federation, and that's Grandmaster Steve Muhammad. Martial arts was already an intrinsic part of black power before Bruce Lee. But when Lee burst onto the scene, he became a living embodiment of liberation struggles for both black Americans and Asian Americans. You still think of yourself Chinese or do you ever think of yourself as North American? You, you, you know what I want to think of myself? As a human being. Because, I mean, I don't want to sound like, you know, as Confucius say, but under the sky, under the heaven, man, there is but one family. Let me just take a moment to mention that women were always part of Wuxia. When Warner Brothers was testing the American market for martial arts, they released three films. The Five Fingers of Death, Bruce Lee in The Big Boss, and Lady Whirlwind with Angela Mao. She's deadly. She's Lady Whirlwind, mistress of the death blow, queen of the deep thrust. But as the Kung Fu craze progressed in the 1970s, women were largely written out of the picture. Bruce Lee's meteoric rise and sudden death left this enormous void that film studios tried to cash in on. For the next decade, movie theaters were flooded by clones bearing the name Bruce Lee, Bruce Lai, Bruce Leong, Bruce Lee, Dragon Lee, and Bruce Lee with an eye. Over a hundred Bruceploitation films were released, most of them trashy ripoffs. Bruce Lee the icon became Bruce Lee the stereotype. How do we take this all back? The wise master speaking in unintelligible Cohen's the nunchucks and shirtless posturing and yellow tracksuit. There was only one Bruce Lee, even if there were dozens of actors forced to imitate him. Instead of the outer shell of Bruce Lee, can we remember the inner fire? Can we remember that he was a kick in the face to the establishment? 
an eye poke to anyone who thought that a five foot six Chinaman could never be a superhero or a major international star. <laughs> Can we remember that Kung Fu isn't just wheel kicks and leaps in the air? Kung Fu is defiance against an authoritarian regime, whether it's the Qing Dynasty or white supremacy. <laughs>